Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, SPC 209 Interpersonal Communications. Uh, today's lecture is uh, we're, we're, we're rocketing all the way through chapter 14, uh, leadership in small groups. Okay, what we're going to talk, talk, to about, uh, talk about today is how leaders engage in the small group context. Now, we're very used to thinking of leaders as being like the President of the United States, some commander in the Army, some, some, some uh, business baron who is the CEO of a major corporation. When most of us are more, come in more contact with uh, uh, leaders in the small groups we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of the leadership activities that we're going to be involved in as professionals are going to be in these small groups. Very, very few people get to lead a major international corporation. Only 45 people in the history of the United States have ever been president. Uh, you know, fewer have been you know, Speaker of the House or, or Leader of the Senate. So our leadership opportunities are probably going to be from a, you know, 3 to 12 people. So what we're going to do is talk about leaders and leadership. First of all, let's talk about a definition. Uh, a leader is a group role and has a high status conferred with it, okay? Uh, by the very nature of leader, the role of leader, it is a group function. It is a function that has to take place in a group. You can't lead one person, okay? Uh, also, the nature of being a leader is a, it is a status that is conferred on the position. Key thing about that is conferred. It's not organic to the person. It's not organic. It's the group agrees that the leader should be the one in charge. Now, we're going to talk about how they get that leadership is conferred and why that leadership is conferred and that status is conferred. But we need to remember that leadership is a function of the group and it is conferred and is a status associated with it is conferred by the group. Now, leadership... Leadership is a function of communication. It is behaviors, it is influence with the context of moving a group to the completion of some task. Okay, if we don't have a task to complete, okay, if we don't have some goal to achieve, there is no need for a leader. So organic to that, not only is it a function of a group, it also involves communication, behaviors, and influence within the context of moving a group to the completion of some task. Okay? All right, so we kind of understand, have, a, have an understanding of what leaders and leadership are. Let's talk about how they're uh, chosen. The first way they're chosen is by an external authority. And this is very often the case. Uh, when a business context, uh, the boss, the branch manager says, okay, hey, listen, we're putting together a small group. It'll be you eight people, and Bob, you're in charge, okay? That is an external authority appointing the leader. It's probably the simple, it's the simplest, it's the most direct, it's the least confusing. And then by assigning authority to that individual, the external uh, authority confers authority and responsibility on to the group leader, okay? So it's much more direct, it's much more clear cut. Now, sometimes the leader will emerge based on traits. Okay, the leader will emerge based on traits associated with the individual who becomes the leader. Now, let's all be honest. Okay? In a lot of cases, the traits that we're going to be talking about are going to be physical traits. All right? We are uh, more likely to have people emerge as leaders who are considered more attractive within the culture that we're, uh, they're coming from. All right? It's not a coincidence that in almost every elect presidential election in U.S. history where there is a significant or noticeable difference in height, between two of the candidates, inevitably in the United States, almost every time, the taller candidate will be elected president. That that's, it's, it's way, happens way more often than we can consider uh, 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 coincidental, okay? Um, we are attracted to people who uh, meet certain societal or cultural uh, expectations for what a leader looks like. For those of y'all who have seen Moneyball, uh, that a really good baseball movie with Brad Pitt. 
Uh, in Jonah Hill, there's this scene where these old guys are sitting there going, well, he's a good pitcher because he looks like a good pitcher. I mean, they were basing their draft picks based on attractiveness of the players because there was a way uh, they thought a pitcher should look. And there are ways that culturally we think leaders should look. Okay, if you go back to the 1960 presidential election, John Kennedy was elected president because he was, and the only deciding factor for many, many people was Richard Nixon looked shifty. He looked like a crook. He, his eyes darted around, he had this pointy nose, he had a, had a receding hairline. John Kennedy was clearly the more attractive candidate and that helped him a great deal. People who saw the debates on uh, uh, TV said Kennedy won all those presidential debates. People that listened to it on radio thought Nixon did, but more people were watching TV than radio, so it was the, the election went to Kennedy. Now, we also uh, select one of the traits that we're talking about. So we, we, well, I'll write these down real quick. There is attractiveness. And then there is communication. Now by communication, we're talking about leaders that are fluent. It's usually associated with confidence. They demonstrate the nonverbal traits that we normally consider to have confidence. They stand up straight, they make eye contact, they keep their hands away from themselves. They have those uh, uh, you know, uh, non-retiring, uh, non-verbal qualities that we uh, like. Uh, by fluency, we mean that they're from, that they use words easily. They don't. They, they use. They can speak quickly. They understand the use of the language. But also, one thing that's been noticed over and over again in studies is leaders communicate more. In the selection process, it's the person that talks the most or communicates the most, even if it's by email. It's the person that communicates the most that's gonna become the leader of the small group. Now. Is that a chicken or an egg sort of thing? Do they become the leader because they're, they communicate more and people just are, are, are gonna give them the role because they seem to be taking it? Or are they organically uh, uh, have more leadership characteristics so that causes them to be more confident, that causes them to communicate more? I mean, we can argue that all day long, but in general terms, okay, leaders of small groups communicate more so one of the things to take away from this is if you want to be the leader of the small group get in there and start talking early uh, don't ramble don't babble don't they but be specific but communicate a lot and people will uh, uh, take out give you a, a leadership of a small group okay uh, an example uh, way back when when I was a federal investigator I met a guy who for the original uh, World Trade Center bombing uh, not 9-11, but the one before that, walked into a room full of, uh, uh, of law enforcement agencies. There were 57 different law enforcement agencies involved from the state of Connecticut uh, because Connecticut, uh, New York, and uh, New Jersey all had offices there. They all wanted a piece of the investigation. Uh, he was a bomb expert from the FBI in Washington. He took the train up the next day. He walked into this big room, which is this madhouse. He walked up, the guy's about six foot four, he's a big imposing dude. He steps up on a little platform at the front of the room and just says, hey, uh, I've been sent up here by the FBI in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I am now in charge of this investigation. I need everybody to take a seat. And everybody took a seat, nobody argued with him. Now, he had authority from the FBI, from the Federal Bureau of Investigations, but he also had those traits, both physical and communicative, that we look for that just made him the leader, okay? So, and again, uh, Amy Cuddy uh, from the Harvard Business School, uh, Dr. Cuddy says, fake it till you make it. If you act like you're a leader, people are gonna make you a leader, okay? All right, so how do we decide leadership? So those are the two basics. Uh, they emerge from authority, and there are other you know, ways where they say it will happen, but basically, we pick leaders either because they're given to us or because uh, they exhibit traits we expect leaders to have in our culture, okay? So let's talk about how uh, uh, the situation decides it. The third one is so we have uh, external authorities, traits, and then we have a situation. So the situation decided 
The situation decides the leaders. So that's going to happen in two phases. The first phase is, well, right off the bat, we're going to eliminate a large portion. We're going to eliminate a large portion of group membership. All right, there's going to be, in any group of, of uh, 8 to 12 people, there's going to be 7 people that just don't want the job. And they're going to immediately retire, or they're going to be forced away from the leadership uh, issue fairly quickly. Okay? Uh, and that's phase one, where a large portion of the group is eliminated for consideration for leadership. Some will just not be suitable. Some will not want the job. Some will be pushed away from the job. Uh, and what you wind up with is in the second stage, there is a pronounced leadership struggle. Now, this doesn't have to be nasty, okay? This doesn't have to wind up, you know, with people throwing haymakers at each other. This is just a, 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 when, if there's no externally appointed, if there's no one that steps up because of their... Uh, their, their personal traits or their communication skills. If we have to go through some sort of uh, 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 internal uh, selection process, in the second stage, you come to a leadership struggle. Now, in some cases, that's going to be a head-to-head -head struggle. Clearly, there's going to be, you know, the way we usually describe it now is two alpha personalities are going to wind up going head-to-head, -head, okay? Uh, in others, it will involve coalition building, okay? Well, it's seeing who's, you know, uh, we've thrown together three offices. We've gotten two people from this office, two people from this office, and four people from this office. Well, whoever is the leader of that four-person group is going to have an opportunity to, to, to step into leadership because they have a coalition or they have the largest number of people supporting them. Okay, In a lot of instances, these struggles are going to be kind of subtle. They're not going to be really aggressive. They're not going to be above board. It's going to be people quietly reaching out to other members of the group. It's going to be people quietly taking functions, okay, while well, everybody will be sitting around. And again, you see this all the time, especially uh, when non-work related things where, you know, and we've been in this experience where everybody's sister here and goes, okay, so who wants to be in charge? And people go, oh, and, and the expectation is nobody's going to want to say, I will. So what happens is everybody just kind of goes, well, and then what happens is in that first phase, in those first meeting, in that first meeting, first couple of meetings, you're going to have a large number of people that are going to go, yeah, I don't want it. I don't want it. Okay. Then you're going to have a smaller number of people. Well, we're going to meet next week. Who wants to organize snacks? And well, somebody will put their hand up and say, I'll do it. Okay. Uh, in, in other cases, it'll be where, uh, you know, it's like, People will say, well, you know, you'll see by somebody and there'll be a conversation going on within the group. And one member of the group who's vying for that leadership position will keep going, hey, that's a good point. Giving positive feedback to, to, to the non-competitive members of the group to build that coalition that they're going to need. So again, these leadership struggles aren't necessarily going to be ugly. Sometimes they're subtle. But it can lead to hard feelings within the group. And that's going to have to be addressed because here's the problem with the leadership struggle. It's eventually going to come down to you know player number one or player number two. And even though player number two doesn't get the job, because he was competing, he's still held in high esteem by the members of the group. Just because, I mean, that is self-evidence because when you have eight to 12 people in a group, and it's seven on one side and five on the other. There's five people that thought this other guy should be the leader of the group, okay? And you have to acknowledge that as the leader. The second place finisher is still going to have considerable influence in the group. And that has to be acknowledged and it has to be understood. If you just kind of blow it off and say, well, I'm in charge now, that second place finisher can cause a lot of dissent within the group and can cause a lot of problems for the overall success of the group. Okay? The next, okay? Now, the leader is going to need to have certain communicative skills. 
the leader is going to need to have certain communication skills. And these skills fall into three basic categories, okay? Their skills will facilitate task-related functions. We're going to call that operational communication. These are the communication skills used to help the group stay on course in achieving their final goal. Okay? Things that are associated with the operational goals of the group. Okay? The next there are going to be what we call procedural related functions. These are going to be those administrative functions. Okay? Coordinating resources, management of the administration, okay? Things that have to be done to provide resources for the operational functions, but don't necessarily have to do directly. You know, making sure we have meeting rooms coordinated, making sure we have printer paper. All that stuff that a small group needs to survive that's not directly related with achieving the operational goals of the group. And then finally, there's a relationship function. Related functions. And this is associated with the people in the group. Okay? This is people focus. Now, three basic sets of communication skills a leader needs. Operational, administrative, and people. Or as task related, procedural related, and relationship related. Now it's possible for a group leader to defer some of these uh, functions to group members. In fact, a good leader will do that. For instance, let's say that a group leader has been selected uh, either from an external force or within the group because of you know, those physical straits, because of the, uh, 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 the communication skills. Uh, and then we've gone through a selection process within the group. And in any event, we have a leader who is very good at doing the operational tasks that will help us meet our goals. But he just doesn't have the time or inclination to do the, all the administrivia associated with keeping the group functioning and making sure all the resources are there. Okay, so it's perfectly possible, and this is one uh, a very, very viable strategy that they teach in a lot of leadership courses. You know, you take those task related functions and the, the leader keeps them close so that uh, he or she can maintain the track toward the goals. But then those procedural or administrative tasks, he can defer those to the person who came, the second finisher in the leadership competition. Okay, gives them a vital function, gives them something to do to focus on. They are clearly popular with a, a, a subset of the group, and they can leverage that popularity in order to get that administrative thing done. Now, the people, the relationship, I mean, that is something that every leader should have sort of built into their DNA. Okay, every leader should be uh, conscious of the relationships, the people that are engaged in the group, and that's all fine, that's all well and good, okay? Uh, this is like scheduling uh, potlucks, uh, pizza parties, uh, you know, making sure that everybody's getting t recognition for the contribution they're making. Okay, these that can also be, uh, you know, it, it, we we've got people in our offices that do the birthdays. We've got people within our offices that are responsible for uh, planning the, uh, uh, you know, uh, dinners out or what at Christmas parties. Okay, so we have people who do those. Uh, so sometimes we can defer the relationship piece as well if we're the group leader. But these are all uh, 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 the functions or communication skills that a leader is going to have to be aware of and knowledgeable of. Because even if he defer, he or she defers the procedural related task, those administrations to someone else, the leader of the small group is still accountable for those, okay? want to make sure that's very clear, okay, that the leader is accountable for everything. Because we've all been in situations 
where the small group leader has deferred that people piece off to uh, the people focus function and communication off to another person. And what do they wind up doing? They just go like, I could care less. I pot like whatever. Okay. And that creates dissension within the group because those people communication skills, okay, don't really uh, uh, come across. And so that's a key core skill for a small group leader that they're not exhibiting. Same with the administrative functions. I may defer that to someone else in the small group. If it doesn't get done, the members of the group are gonna hold the uh, uh, leader uh, uh, responsible, okay? So these core communication skills are necessary for every small group leader, even if that small group leader isn't necessarily executing themselves, they are still gonna be held accountable for them, okay? Let's talk about uh, leadership styles real quick. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into any great detail. I want you to read the book on that because there are literally thousands of different uh, lists you could go to for leadership traits. Uh, so read the book. Uh, the one of the books is as good as any. There's no need for me to go over them again, but I will tell you uh, with finals coming up in a couple of weeks, you really need to read the book on that. Okay. You might see some of them again in a couple of weeks. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so let's talk about leadership and power. Okay? Power is how a leader motivates. You need power to motivate. Now, we may say that we motivate through, through uh, a mutual understanding of our uh, combined goals. That's fine. But power is involved, is how leaders motivate. Legitimate power. Legitimate power. Okay? Legitimate power is power that comes from the position of being the leader. All right? Especially if you're uh, uh, appointed by that external uh, uh, authority and given the, the position of leader, then you have legitimate power. Okay? Legitimate power is power that, that emanates from just the fact that you are the group leader. Okay? There is expert power. One of the things in my 30 years with the Department of Defense, especially as I got further into my career, I always wanted to be the smartest guy in the room on my subject matter, okay? I always wanted to be the subject matter expert on any, any time I was in a meeting, I wanted to be the subject matter expert on my subject. And if I wasn't the smartest guy in the room, I wanted to have the smartest guy in the room working for me to back me up in the meeting so that if I needed to, I could defer to them, okay? Because I knew that power came from my expertise. Because I could influence, even if it was not a small group, even if it was, you know, like a four-star general or a cabinet secretary sitting across the table from me, okay, my power came from my expertise. And nobody was going to be able to argue with me about it. And I could influence by my expertise. The same thing goes in small groups. If everybody knows you're the smartest person, Okay, on a topic, and you say, no, that is not going to work, and here's why, you will become powerful. You can even become the group leader based simply on that. Okay, if you're the expert in the room as a leader, you will have that power. And you will be able to motivate and influence people simply because you're the expert. Okay, now, referent power... Make sure I spell this right. All, I get, all these, I guess. Referent power is power associated with uh, attractiveness, like ability, charisma. It's just people are going to look at you and go, well, yeah, the guy looks like a leader. We'll make him the leader. Okay? Uh, it, it's that, you know, you've known people that were just, I mean, you just, they're leaders. They have that charisma. People are attracted to them as leaders. They're the funniest. They're the brightest. They're the strongest. They're the best athlete. 
mean, there's any number of reasons, but that is people giving you that power, granting you that power based on some trait, okay? There is information power. Now, information power is pretty much what it says. If you control the information, you can control the uh, uh, the environment. Okay, you can control the group. And that's pretty much what, you know, we, we've been seeing that for, for 30, 40 years. They, if you control the information, you control the world. Okay, the information power is where that shows up. Okay, and then finally, the other way to get power is reward and coercion. I mean, the, the fabled carrot and stick. You can give somebody reward or you can punish them if you have the authority to punish them. Okay, you have the power to punish them. Okay? So, leadership comes from, power is how a leader motivates, and it can be legitimate power that, that comes from just inherently being the leader. It can be expert power from being the smartest guy in the room on a topic it can be referent power that people give to you because of your attractiveness your charisma uh, uh, your likability there's information power where you control what people need to know to do their jobs and then there's rewarding coercion uh, where you can provide positive rewards or negative uh, coercive or punishments uh, to people who uh, don't perform the way you think they should is group leader okay so now let's talk about the roles people will fill within the small group again there's a list of a million of these but I'm going to uh, focus on a couple okay a role is a pattern of behavior expected of group members so there are formal roles Former roles are things like you're the recorder, you're the uh, you're the uh, uh, the supply guy, you're going to be responsible for uh, reserving the rooms. Okay, some of those are positions or titles given to a person by the group or a larger organization. You know, one of the first roles with former roles that is oftentimes given is group leader, and we can assign that group leader role by election, by you know, and we've already been through that through external authorities. We'll assign that role. Then there are informal or more appropriately emergent roles now these emergent roles okay is a person in the group begins to assume behaviors expected of the group without being given a specific title you know you're very good at taking notes and everybody notices that you're constantly taking notes you become the group secretary okay you are good at, 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 at you know, coordinating emails. You are good at coordinating video teleconferences. You become the communications person. Okay, These are roles that aren't formally uh, given, but uh, because as the, your personalities and, and, and capabilities of the group members begin to emerge, everybody pretty much agrees that this is the role this person should have. Now, these roles fall into three separate types. There are task associated roles. Now a task associated role is a role, as it says, associated with a task. These would be things like leader, okay? That's a function, initiator, The initiator is going to be the person who offers ideas or suggestions or initiate or, or begins conversations. There's going to be the opinion seeker. The opinion seeker is going to be the person who within the group gains information from people and talking to them. There's going to be the uh, what's called the information giver. I prefer to call this the researcher. 
And that's the person who goes out and will find if there's an information gap that needs to be filled. This is the person that would just jump in the gap and go, okay, hey, listen, uh, we had this conversation last week when we met. We didn't know what the laws were in Wyoming about this. So I Googled, and here's the answer to that, okay? Uh, there's the secretary, as we've already discussed. All right? And then there's the, uh, uh, the devil's advocate. Now, the devil's advocate, we oftentimes think, is the jerk who always just sits back in the back and goes, well, that's not true. You shouldn't. Okay. The devil's advocate is a very important role in a small group because as we talked about group think last week, it's the devil's advocate that will throw things out there to <coughs> sort of kill that group think idea. Okay. So the devil's advocate is a very important role. And in some organizations, it's assigned as a function. All right, I have on a couple of occasions been told, okay, your job, in the military we call it, you're gonna be the red team. You're gonna be the guys that are gonna attack my plans. Okay, so it's always good to have someone in there to be the devil's advocate, to prevent group think, to sort of think in an adversary position to come up with uh, problems with your uh, ideas. So our task associated roles are leader, who is, in, who is in charge? The initiator, the person who starts conversations. The opinion seeker who will g gather information from people in the group. The information giver or researcher. The secretary and the devil's advocate. Now remember, with each of these three functions or types of roles, uh, again, we'll be talking about uh, task uh, and, and two more. All of these are either formal or emergent, okay? I can assign an initial, hey, listen, it's gonna be your job if you see something, I need you to get in there and start start conversations. I need you to get in there and I need you to get in there and seek information from people in the group. I need you to do my research. I need you to go out and hit the internet and find out what we need to know. Okay, these can all be both informal and emergent. Okay, the second type of uh, uh, role we're going to talk about, all right, are maintenance roles. Maintenance roles. Now, these roles could include, all right, and these roles, maintenance roles are responsible for things that have to be done uh, to uh, keep the group functioning. Okay? So, a maintenance role could include, okay, the supporter encourager. The supporter encourager is the person who provides emotional warmth, praise, acceptance. For everyone in the group. There's the harmonizer. The harmonizer is the coalition builder, the tension reliever, promotes group peace, uses humor, reconciles conflicts within the group. Okay? There's the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is responsible for controlling the channels of communication and the flow of information uh, uh, because we can't be all things that you can't absorb everything at some point in time you need to have somebody within the group go okay listen we can't just keep going you know there's I googled this and we came up with 4.2 million websites we can't read all of them I think we've got enough now to make a decision okay that's the gatekeepers job to manage the amount of information coming and then there's The feeling expressor. This is the person who is responsible for monitoring the, media, the, 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 the feelings of the group, uh, the moods of the group, is sort of expressing them in words so that the leader has an idea of what's going on within the group. And again, remember, each of these roles can be formal or informal and emergent. I have owned many instances in the past when leading small groups, called one person aside and said, hey, listen, you talk to everybody. I need you to make sure I get appropriate feedback on where we're at with everything, especially when we're in some really high stress environments. It's like, 
I need to know when we're pushing people too hard. I need to know when people are getting close to the edge. I need to know when people are fighting. You know, the feeling expressor was the person who would in the group say, hey, listen, I know everybody here is really stressed. We need to think of a way to where we can reconcile a lot of this conflict. Again, that takes you back to the harmonizer. So a lot of these roles you're gonna find are multifunctions within the individuals, okay? So we have our task oriented roles, then we have our maintenance roles, which are not like in maintenance, it's the maintenance of the relationships in the group, okay? So maintenance roles are the supporter, the harmonizer, the gatekeeper, and the feeling expressor, okay? And then finally, we have the disruptive roles. Now disruptive roles are not positive, okay? But they are roles that will be taken up. One of the disruptive roles will be the stage hog. The stage hog is someone who always wants the recognition, always wants the group to be about them, okay? They always want to be the center of attention and have to, make, have to be talking all the time. There's the isolationist. The isolationist just withdraws from the group. Even if they, you know, and in some cases, extreme cases, they just stop, attend, stop participating. They won't respond to emails. They won't respond to group text. Uh, they just remove themselves from the group. Sometimes they'll be present and still be an isolationist. Okay? There's the clown. Who attempts at every instance to make, and this is oftentimes, uh, they're involved in horseplay, practical jokes, comic routines. The goal, and again, sometimes that's a good function. The harmonizer that we talked about before under maintenance roles will a lot of times use humor to build coalitions and build peace within the group and relieve tension. The clown takes it farther than that and not only is it goes beyond uh, uh, relieving tension and building unity, they will actually take it to the point where their actions begin to create tension, okay? There is the blocker. The blocker. And the blocker is pretty straightforward. Yeah, I hate it. I hate everything. I hate every idea you've ever had. You got a new idea? I hate it. It's not going to work. I, the blocker is totally negative all the time. Okay? There's the fighter. The fighter is going to take offense at everything and starts arguing immediately and then is going to try to bully other members of the group. Not persuade, but threaten, you know, or just get, you know, even if it's just verbal intimidation, the fighter is going to try to maintain, try to force people to do what they want. And then the last disruptive role we want to talk about is the cynic. The cynic is going to display just a horrible outlook about everything. They hate everything. They hate everybody. <laughs> it's not, nah. It's a little bit different from the uh, blocker who's going to argue about everything. They're just going to, uh, it's not just ideas that they're blocking. They don't like anybody. They don't like anything. Okay? So now the, when, when you do have disruptors, okay, you have those disruptive roles. It's your job as the leader to use that power and influence that we talked about just a second ago to bring these people into more positive maintenance or task-oriented roles, okay? And these are not necessarily good roles. These are just things, you know, again, people will begin to assume these roles after a while. I've known, you know, again, the spider and cynic I've, I've dealt with rarely, but the blocker, the isolationist, the stage hog I've all dealt with, and to be honest with you, on more than a couple of occasions, I've been told I was the clown, okay? And one of my maturing processes in small group leadership was I had to stop that. You cannot be the leader and be the clown. It is just an oxymoron, all right? So those are our, our, our roles are formal and emergent. Uh, they can be task-oriented, maintenance-oriented, 
or there can be disruptive roles within the group that you need to be prepared for. <coughs> okay. So the last thing we want to talk about is problem solving. Okay? Group problem, you're there to solve a problem. If there wasn't a problem or some goal to be achieved, you wouldn't be there, would you? There would be no need to have the small group. So let's talk about the three common characteristics of a problem. Call it problem components. Problem components. All right? First of all, you have an undesirable situation. You have an undesirable situation. We're going to call that the need. Every problem has a need that needs to be solved. Okay? A need is something that needs to be dealt with. Because a need leads you to your goal. Okay? The desired situation that you want to be in is the goal. All right? And then finally, we have Every, plan, every problem has an obstacle. Because if there wasn't an obstacle between the need and the goal, we wouldn't need a plan. We wouldn't need to solve. It would solve itself. Okay? You can't have a need and a goal and not have it because you would just immediately go to the goal. Okay? I mean, if you were... You know, we don't have a pro uh, our goal is to not catch on fire when we're standing in water because there's no need. Okay, water extinguishes fire. So we know that there is no need or no obstacle there. So we don't need a pro we don't have a problem. Within any problem, you always have you need to have an undesired state, which is the need, an unfulfilled situation, an undesirable situation. You have your goal, which is your desired uh, uh, situation, your desired end state. And then you have your obstacle, which is what's between you and it. So let's talk about the steps of problem solving. Okay? There are five steps. Number one, we define the problem. A lot of times when you really get down to the nitty gritty and start digging into the problem, okay, you're going to find that the problem isn't really what you thought it was. Hey, listen, uh, our, our, our workers on the production line aren't turning out the level of production that they need to. Clearly, our workers need to be talked to, uh, reward coercion, totally, well, then it comes to find out when you go down and start talking to them, it's not that the machines aren't working well. It's not that the workers are lazy. It's just that nobody ever trained the workers on how on the new uh, aspects or the new features of the new equipment. Okay? So when in digging into the problem, when we thought we had a production problem, in truth, what we really have is a training issue. Okay? So defining the problem should be really focused on... Because a lot of times you don't know what the actual, you, you aren't aware of all the details of the problem. And it's hard to get a good solution to the problem if you don't actually know what the problem is. So step number one, define the problem. Step number two, okay? Analyze what you found. That seems kind of obvious. But a lot of times when people finally define this, uh, or think what they find is a, a problem, they immediately launch into uh, uh, coming up with a solution when they haven't really examined the data they got from step number one. Okay, so in step number two, we're gonna go over all the data we've achieved while defining the problem and sort of make sure we understand all, well, what training do they not have? Okay, do they not understand the mechanics of the, uh, uh, the equipment? Do they not understand the new way that the uh, raw materials are coming into the process? Where exactly do we need to focus on? Okay, then the third thing we need to do, okay, 
is we begin to generate solutions. Now in generating solutions, okay, that can take the form of brainstorming where everybody just throws out ideas, all right, and without, with no criticism, you know, there's a million different ways to generate solutions. Basically, one of you, what you want to make sure you do, even if you're not absolutely brainstorming where people can throw out any idea at all, and there is no criticism, you just make a big long list of possible solutions, and then you go back through and eliminate some of them. What you need to do when generating solutions is, is to make sure that everyone involved in that process is engaged and feel like they can come up and provide solutions without any negative feedback. Again, remember, this is where you're going to have to get the blocker and the cynic under control and the clown as well. Those disruptive roles during this part of stage are going to have to be where you really as a leader executing strong power, uh, strong influence in order to make sure that when you're generating solutions, okay, uh, that you're bringing everybody in. Again, this is where the isolationist may have the best solution, but because they're withdrawing from the group, you know, they don't, they're not going to give you their input, input, okay? After you generate the solutions, you implement the, you evaluate them. In evaluation, it's where you go through and decide which is the best solution or solutions. You may find out in many instances that you need two or three different solutions, okay? You know, it's a, it's a standard uh, a phrase in, in, in a lot of leadership. There is no such thing as a simple solution to a complex problem. Because if it, there was a simple solution, it wouldn't be a complex problem. It would be a simple problem, and it would have already been solved, okay? So when you evaluate the solutions, be open to the fact that you may need to engage in one or two of them, okay, or more, all right? And remember also that in evaluation, okay, you may, you have to do it in a way that doesn't negatively impact or degrade the people who made the solutions or else people will slip from those uh, 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 task roles into those disruptive roles, okay? And then finally, all right, on the fifth step is to implement and assess. Now, finally is implement and assess. Okay, let me make sure I'm gonna have room because I wanna show you something over here in just a second about how oftentimes you should work this, okay? And in implementing and assessing, a lot of times there's going to be the role of the group leader to say, okay, we're going with solution one and we're going with solution four, okay? Or we're gonna take part A from one, we're gonna take B and C from part four and then all of five. That implement and assess role is going to be the implementation is a lot of time going to be a function and we're going to talk about how we come to those conclusions some models for how we come to that implementation and selection okay but also as important is the assessment piece here because you need to go back you can't just go up oh, solutions found everybody go home we're good okay you have to then assess whether or not your solution is solving the problem so in a lot of instances it's going to go like this. You're going to find to define the problem. You're going to analyze the problem. You're going to generate solutions. You're going to evaluate solutions you're going to implement and assess the solutions and the result of that assessment is probably going to lead you back into defining the problem because while oftentimes within organizations within businesses within groups you will solve one problem. Implementing that solution is just going to identify another problem that you're going to need to solve. If that didn't happen, you would, you know, businesses would run smoothly, organizations would run smoothly. You just put things on track and then you walk away from it. Okay? 
So in problem solving, we define the problem, we analyze the problem, we generate solutions, we evaluate solutions, and then we implement and so assess the, uh, uh, the solution. And again, oftentimes, assessing the solution leads you directly back into defining a new problem. Or what you may find out is you didn't define the problem right the first time. Okay? So we've got this drop of production since we brought in this new equipment. We had defined the problem, okay, as being a drop of production. We analyzed the problem and found out it was a lack of training, okay? We generated some training solutions. We picked two of them and we implemented them. And then what we found out after we implemented them is that production didn't go up. So clearly we did not define the problem, so we have to go back into this process and do it over and over again until the problem is resolved. And then generally what happens when the problem is resolved, we have another problem. Wow, production has gone up, now we've got a transportation problem. We can't ship the amount of goods. We got a sales problem. Our website won't accommodate enough customers to generate the sales we need for this, okay? So problem solving is a circular process. It's cyclical. It goes around and always restarts. Okay, so finally. Let's talk about leadership functions and problem solving. Now, the leadership function and problem solving goes along a continuum. Okay, way down here on this extreme end is authoritarian, okay? This is the rule of one. This is where, hey, I'm the team leader. I got the authority. You're gonna do what I tell you to do. This is the solution I wanna implement. And hey, that sometimes works. Especially, you know, like in, in the military, that's exactly how it works all the time. In law enforcement, it works that way a lot. I've got the rank, you're going to do what I tell you to do. Okay. Now, in less formal situations where it's not an external authority, it's a developed role, that's not going to work because those people who gave you that power have the authority to take it back. So what oftentimes we look for, if we step down a little bit, we look for a compromise. Now a compromise is where we try to modify the plan a little bit so that everybody can get on, you know, so not everybody is happy with everything, but everybody's happy with enough that they'll go along with the leader. Okay, the leader will come out with a compromise that everybody can tolerate, right? They're maybe not happy with it, but everybody is kind of engaged at a lower level. The next opportunity we have is voting, which is simply majority rule, okay? And in voting, some people are gonna say yes, some people are gonna say no. And if more people say yes, then that's what you do. But the problem with voting is that you're excluding the minority from participation in acceptance, okay? You know, you may say, well, they participated, they got to vote, but they were told that your opinion doesn't matter because you lost. You're not part of the majority, so your opinion didn't matter in this instance. We're going the other way. The last thing, okay, is build a consensus. All right, is to build a consensus where everybody is engaged and supports the solution. Now, in a lot of instances, you know, and consensus can be the hardest, clearly the hardest to do. Because if you, you're dealing with three to 12 people, you're dealing with probably, you know, especially the bigger you get, building consensus becomes harder. If you've got three people, building consensus and you're all there for the, the relatively same goals and same purposes, building a consensus is relatively easy. 
But if you've got 12 people that come from incredibly diverse backgrounds and, and aren't there with necessarily the same goals, uh, then building a consensus can be impossible. Uh, you're just never going to be able to get 12 people or 9 or 10 people to come to the same conclusion where everybody goes, absolutely. If any of y'all have served on the board of your church, a volunteer group, getting 12 people to agree on something like that is nearly impossible, okay? So consensus is very difficult. So if you can't get consensus and get everybody to, to agree, what we do is we go, fine, let's take a vote, okay? Let's just vote on it, okay? Well, well, everybody votes on it, but what if there's three proposals and you've got nine people and three people vote for this and three people vote for that, three people vote for the other one, okay? Well, voting didn't work, okay? So if you can't get a vote, you get a compromise. Well, okay, I know that you three over there hate this idea, but what if we took part of your idea and lumped it in and everybody will go, all right, <clears throat> I don't like it, but I can, I can tolerate it, okay? So that's a compromise. And then finally, if you just can't get it done, if nobody's going to get it and you, have, you feel like you have the power to influence enough to where you're just going to go, hey, listen, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been in this business since, you know, since, since Reagan was president. This is what we're going to do. I'm an expert. You're not. This is where we're going because this is what we have to do. Okay, that is the authoritarian rule. Are any of these bad? Okay, no. A lot of time authoritarian rule is very good because you can move very quickly. You don't have to worry about you know, building a consensus or taking time to vote or, or dealing with the hard feelings of a compromise. A lot of time the most effective way and the best way to come to a pro the solution of a problem uh, in the leadership, uh, the leader, execute your leadership function in problem solving is just say, I was given this job by the boss. The boss says I'm the subject matter expert on this. This is what we're doing. And that's what you do, okay? Because it's quick, it's concise, it gives firm direction to the group, okay? Is it possible that you're going to alienate some members of the group and turn them, take them from those productive roles into those disruptive roles? Yeah, that's a possibility, so you have to be careful with that, okay? So it's, we, 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 you know, on, on one extreme we have authoritarian rule, and on the other extreme we have consensus where everybody has to be on board. And there are variations through here, and again, this is a continuum, okay? Is it possible to have something that kind of falls in in here that's it's a little bit of compromise and a little bit of authoritarian rules? Yeah, absolutely. Is it possible to have something that falls in here that's a little bit of compromise and then we vote on it? Absolutely. Okay? So this is a continuum. But the four basic leadership functions in problem solving is to build consensus, take votes, create a compromise, or just execute authoritarian rule while you're the, where you're the leader and you say, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. Class, that is chapter 14. Okay? Leadership in small groups. Okay? Um, that's it, everybody. Have a, uh, if it's your weekend, have a good weekend. If it's your Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, have a good day. And we will uh, see you soon for Chapter 15.